Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Smoville Podcast. I'm Ryan Snelling. And I'm Brian Davids. Did you know that I'm not able to manually switch on and off my country accent? I asked you about that. I was curious because some people that I've talked to claim that the that they can switch it off like an on off switch. I would like to meet that person. And I know like hotshot Hollywood actors are able to switch their accents on and off, but I'm someone who for one I didn't even realize that my accent was that thick because we talked about this before. I don't know if I said it on air or not, but I'm someone who sees rednecks like everyone else. Like I'm not <laughs> I'm not in that bubble like there are people in Kentucky that I look at and I'm like, "Wow, I'm glad I don't sound like them." So it's interesting to hear you say that I have a particular accent, but there's no way I can get rid of it. Like I'd have to think very hard about what I'm saying for me to to change it up. And I, you know, I'm terrible at impressions. I don't think I've done any on here, but I, I just can't do it. This is this is me, Brian. This is me. Here's the thing, though. When I talk to you on the cell phone, or when I've talked to you on a cell phone before, your accent was actually heavier on a cell phone than on a mic. So. You're doing something when you're in this mode. But I think that was late at night, though. We usually we usually don't record this that late. But of course, I'm on. Oh, I, no, it was totally normal. Are you sure? I'm, I'm just, I don't know, man. I, I can't even remember the conversation. Let's let's talk more on the phone, and then maybe we'll uh we'll, we'll see what my patterns are with my accents. But I'd like to call you more, but you don't pick up. I absolutely I hate talking on one of my least favorite pastimes is talking on the phone. I could tell you 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 tried so hard not to pick up when I needed you that one night. <laughs> hey, I sat on the phone for an hour and a half with you, sir. I talked through all your 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 dilemmas at that time. There's no way in hell that that was an hour and a half long conversation. It absolutely was. I'll pull up the call log, brother. I will too, and I'll post it on Instagram. We'll show everyone in Schmoville how long we actually talked on the phone. That it was, was a great talk. At least an hour. At least an hour. That was a great talk, though. It changed your life. You know what we didn't talk about on that phone call that I'm ready to talk about here today? What's that? I'm talking about Schmoes No in Collider today because, after all, this is the official after show for all things Smoes No in Collider video. I feel like we haven't done one of these in forever, and I know it's. It's just been a week, right? But I feel like I haven't talked to you in a long time. You mean we're not the all speculation show like some people seem to think we are? Well, we'll get to that because I know you, you want to hammer some things out with you and Christian this week. But we'll, we'll get there, I promise. Can I issue a clarification for Ken, the pit boss, Knapsack's sake? Yeah, I was going to bring that in. So I, I figured that this was, the, this was the housekeeping you wanted to do, correct? Yeah, last week I said how the show felt more organized and controlled under Miri's reign. Of course, I'm talking about the Schmoes No Show. When she took over, Mark Ellis once joked how they actually have outlines that they now follow. However, Ken, in the YouTube comments, reminded me in a cool way that he did outline every single minute of the show from phase three to phase five. They just failed to use them unless they needed a coaster, as he put it. But what I really meant was phase three and phase five felt more like controlled chaos, while Miri's reign, which I really consider to be phase six, even though she joined on as producer towards the tail end of phase five, her reign was a bit more controlled and organized, not in terms of the outlines being followed, but in terms of the vibe of the show. And most of that is the studio situation. When you put all these personalities in a small room together with alcohol, you're bound to get an explosion like the Harloffs whenever they bring a clearly Canadian beverage into a movie theater. (laughs) But when it comes to the Collider studio, there's a different vibe because the studio is not a small, tight room with everybody inside of it. So I have some related points on this once we get to the schmoes episode discussion. My next question was, have you had any interesting conversations on Twitter ever since you've been such a divisive figure in the Smoville community? All the time. All the time. I mean, some people will say things in the YouTube comments like, why are grown men doing a a speculation show about a talk show on YouTube? Isn't that kind of weird and pathetic? 
And yet they've never even heard the show whenever they say that. They don't realize that we're recapping all of the programming and giving marketing advice and ways to improve. And we're talking about the various different personalities. It's not just us speculating. The speculation is just what gets the most attention on the Schmoes No Live show. And that's where these type of comments typically come from. People that don't watch us or listen to us yet hear about us on the live show. I'm always baffled by people who say things like that. Because I guess if someone was to ask me, hey, what exactly is Schmoville Podcast? I basically sum it up to a recap show. After show. We gotta stick to after show. People just, it's like they haven't even grasped what that even means or what that is. Like they never even heard of it before. So it's not something that we've invented at all. But two, it's exactly what it's supposed to be. And I understand if you, in general, just don't want to listen to recap shows. But when you sum it up in that way, it just... Kind of makes me say, really? Because it's more than that, and it just serves a purpose, right? Like, obviously, this is something we worked with Christian with to develop. This is what he wants. This is what we want. So it's like, it's serving its purpose. That's fine if you don't want to listen to it. But when you say things like that, it's just ridiculous. But listen to the show first and then pass judgment once you've heard it. Don't pass judgment before you've even listened. And we're in the after show era from Talking Dead to After the Thrones to Hacking Robot. There's an after show for almost everything nowadays. So this network of shows, these personalities, everything that goes on deserves to be discussed from the fan perspective. Let me ask you this question. If you weren't on the Schmoville podcast, would you be listening to the Schmoville podcast? Well, I was listening to the Schmoville podcast some days it was it was more difficult than others, but I certainly was because I'm such a big fan. <laughs> You're speaking to when uh, Ellis and Christian were on, is that correct? Yes, they 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 kind of brought down the quality a great deal during their appearances. <laughs> just kidding. Obviously, those are two of my favorite episodes because I got to just talk to them one on one, and those are great. And I hope we have them on here again soon. But anyway, I, I've just I, I love. Hearing from you guys on Twitter, that's sort of what I was getting to. I've had some interesting conversations so far, some that have kind of been exhausting, but that's okay. That's not everybody. Um, I'll just throw out my, throw out my Twitter, at WhatUpSnell, and uh, I need to do a better job promoting Schmoville Podcast, but part of that is due to the fact that the majority of my followers are still people that I just know personally that aren't going to listen to Schmoville. So my Twitter's at what up Snell. If you want to follow me, uh, Brian, what's your uh, Twitter? I know we'll probably say it again at the end, but you guys can follow me at BDF three, three, one, tweet me anything you'd like, especially Schmoes and Collider related. Okay, so let's get into the headlines for this week, and we talked about this before. They all sort of fall under this umbrella of growth and potential, at least for me. I get excited over watching Schmozno and Collider grow, and I think this was a huge pivotal week. Not to do Donald Trump, but this was a huge pivotal week, in my opinion, and I think we'll... Later on, look back on this week and think of how important this was, but we'll get into that. Do you want to just start with what opened our week in general, which was the Jeremy Johns announcement, right? Yeah, I want to pat myself and ourselves on the back for speculating (laughs) correctly regarding Jeremy Johns joining Collider Video. We knew right away that his surprise visit the week before last was total BS and that he was in town for a very specific reason. I closed our discussion last week by saying that he likely enjoyed himself so much that he wanted to do more. That's why he was back. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Did we speculate as to what the specific arrangement might be, whether it was daily, weekly, monthly? Of course not. We thought it might be once a month, every other month, but we got the gist of it. He was joining Collider Video. And that's the fun of this show, is speculating right or wrong on top of everything else. But add to this fact that I predicted Miri's exit. I predicted Campy's return. This is just a long line of things that we've been pretty on point about. So we've got a better batting average than Kid Christian will give us credit for, even though he tries to misdirect the fans into thinking that we're wrong in some, in some cases, like he did with my Miri concerns that I brought up two months ago. 
look, you can't fault us for being wrong when we don't have all the information that they're purposely withholding from us. But as I keep saying, based on the info that we do have, what we pick up on, I'd say that we're doing pretty well for ourselves. And I meant to say this last week, I know I'm ranting a bit, but after the recent announcement that Screen Junkies is joining the movie news fray, I kept thinking to myself, man, Collider has to make a splash after the Screen Junkies news. And did they ever? They pulled off the coup of the century in landing Jeremy Johns. This is YouTube's version of Durant joining the Warriors. So I bet anything, anything that Screen Junkies announcement created extra incentive for Collider and Complex to lock up Jeremy with a six-figure deal so he can maintain his lavish lifestyle, including a wardrobe budget. You think that Jeremy Johns makes six figures out of this deal? I wouldn't be surprised if they threw everything at him but the kitchen sink after Screen Junkies made the announcement they were jumping into movie news. I would not be surprised whatsoever. I think I would be a little bit, (laughs) but that's only because I have no idea how to gauge this, this profession. Like, of just being in this space of movie news and press, it's hard for me to compare it to anything else out there right now. So six figures sounds a little bit much though. Think about this complex. Look at the company of complex, big company. They locked up Mark Hamill to do a show on Comic-Con HQ. So I think they look at Jeremy like a, like an investment, obviously Hamill's huge, but Jeremy within this space is as good an investment as you can make. And that's the one person that can counter what screen junkies is doing. So this is this is a giant deal. I don't think people are making this into the deal that it is. I mean, it's much bigger than any of us seem to be saying it is. What if John Campia is actually just holding him hostage? That could be true. He maybe he wants a permanent Magic the Gathering partner. I don't know what the deal is, but you know, Christian last week he tried to kind of take a point of mine out of context when he said, "Oh, I said that Jeremy would never move to L.A." And like any person, anyone who theorizes a lot, it's important to present counter arguments to your own theories because the YouTube comments will if you don't. And Jeremy did say recently on Campia's podcast that he'd never leave Washington yeah. because of its clean air, because of his mom. He was taking care of her up there. Also, he just bought a place not too long ago. So all of that aside... I still don't think he's going to move to L.A. If he's smart, he will maintain his Washington residency, his Washington taxpayer status, and essentially commute to work in Burbank. He'd be living the life of an athlete, as most live in Florida or Nevada or Texas, even though they work around the country for their particular team. And that's because those states that I mentioned have no income tax or state income tax. So, Jeremy, make sure to maintain the Jeremy Johns HQ in Washington. California is overpriced, overcrowded, overtaxed. Rent out your house, pay rent at somebody's place in LA, but maintain your Washington residency at all costs. Well, I don't think there's any way that he would do this without living here. That just sounds like a horrible mess. And in my opinion, it doesn't matter at all where he does the Jeremy Johns YouTube channel. Like I know you're talking about... (laughs) income tax and all that but i think didn't i thought john's even mentioned that he was moving to la and that's probably why he had to go back to start the move because you know obviously he wasn't here the entire week let me clarify i'm not saying he's i'm not saying he's gonna sell his house and pack up all his belongings and move down here i think he should keep his stuff up there keep his properties up there rent them out and then basically come here as someone who's commuting from out of state and stay here for a a while, work here, but still maintain his home base, his headquarters in Washington, just like professional athletes do. Derek Jeter lived in Florida, but spent nine months out of the year in New York, still qualified for Florida state income tax, even though the state of New York tried to go after him for that because he was in New York so often. So I think it would be a mistake, especially as someone who lives in California, for him to just give up everything he's built in Washington, his properties, his family, etc., to just bring everything down here and take everything down here. 
baby steps. I'm loving the sports analogies. What are you, John Campia today? What is this? We're recording at an actual reasonable hour where I haven't worked 12 straight hours. So it's a beautiful day here, Saturday uh, morning. I'm jacked up for this show. And I just don't think Jeremy should make a bold move and, and move completely down here. Keep his headquarters up there and see how he likes it for a bit while not creating any contracts as far as lease agreements or purchases when he is down here working. I don't know if Christian was speaking to our Jeremy John speculation when he was talking about, you know, sometimes they're just wildly off track. I don't think using the argument that Jeremy John has never once before thought about coming to Los Angeles it makes us wildly off track. Yeah, yeah, we were wrong, but that makes sense to think that he would not really join Collider because of that. You can still work for Collider in some capacity without moving to L.A. He was, he was working for Screen Junkies for all this time without living in L.A. So it's certainly possible that he could do the same type of arrangement for Collider. And that's what we were thinking. Obviously, having him on Movie Talk every day is the best case scenario for everybody. I mean, that I never expected that. But we still sniff this out because... You know, Campia, we can smell Campia's lies, not lies, but we can smell his BS from a mile away when yeah. he tries to say, oh, it's a surprise visit. Oh, this was completely unexpected. We can sniff that out at this point, having followed him for so long. And there was definitely more than meets the eye in this case. Yeah, I texted you immediately when I saw that Jeremy Johns was back on Monday. And I was like, yeah, it didn't just end at the Las Vegas trip. Like, this is clearly leading to something. So, again, we were, we were on track. You're right. Let's pat ourselves on the back on that one because... Christian certainly won't, but that's okay. So yeah, I mean, just kind of cap that discussion off. So uh, I'm assuming we talked about this quite a bit, but John's coming to Collider Movie Talk. Can you please call him Jeremy? Because between John Campia, or excuse me, John Campia, John Schnepp, it's going to get awfully confusing if we call Jeremy Johns, Johns with all the Johns in the company. Sorry, I go by Snelling, so I try to go by last names. You're right. So... Jeremy, now that he's here, we talked about what he can do for Movie Talk, but now it's pretty much safe to assume that he will be included in all the other shows, um, a more consistent contender in the Schmodown, maybe have his own show at some point, correct? That's all safe to assume? Yeah, I'm sure Christian wanted to build up to these announcements, yeah, but of course this means he's going to be part of the Schmodown a lot more, part of Schmo's Know a lot more, just by association, by being in that studio all the time. So this opens things up for not just Collider, but Schmo's a great deal. Right. So Collider, great job. What a great get. I'm super excited to see where this goes and where this leads. We'll see how John's... Excuse me, Jeremy. I, I'll get I'll get better. Son of a bitch. It, I'm curious to see how Jeremy's audience will transition into Collider because it's literally the exact opposite of what he does on his channel, right? Like short form jump cuts, straight to the point movie reviews versus you know long form movie discussion. So it'll be interesting to see and continue to watch Collider's subscriber count grow since this merger. So. You want to hear something crazy? I would love to. I think he's better in long form discussion than he is in those short jump cut reviews, which he's good at. He's the best at it. I him. agree. But I think he's strongest in a long form discussion like Movie Talk. I agree. I, I think I've said it before on here that as a movie reviewer, I certainly respect him, but he isn't someone that I watch consistently. And I just don't really care for how he does it. And I know they all kind of do jump cuts, but I just feel like he's like strung out on caffeine when he does it. Well, I guess you could say that about flick pick, but um, I, I like Stuckman who's a little yeah. bit more calm and uh, of course Schmoes, but I do like Jeremy in this setting more. But again, I wasn't someone who transitioned from his YouTube channel. So those are the people that I'm. He's got this innate energy like John has where they're able to, to elevate themselves to an energy that most people can't. And that's what's going to make these shows quite special. And man, this is like, these are like the two pioneers of this space joining together, add the schmoes to the mix. And you've got, you've got a dream team. You've got, uh, yeah, you've got a dream team of YouTube, of YouTube movie reviewers, in essence, with all three of these guys, or all four, excuse me. Right. And I'll, I'm curious to see 
and I don't know if anyone's going to speak out on this, but I'm curious to to know like what Christian or Campius thoughts are on the fact that Screen Junkies is starting this news thing because it it probably has caused some worry over there. So I'm just happy that they got Johns in quickly, and that can help them feel a little bit better, you know? Bastard. Did I say Johns again? I'm really sorry. I swear to God I'm not doing that on purpose. Here's the thing. I mean, I've been joking. Andy Signore pulled out of the Ultimate Schmodown because he knew he was going to announce the Screen Junkies news channel, etc. Obviously, I'm just making that up for, for, for drama's sake. But this past Friday... Roth Cornette was on Movie Talk when Dennis hosted. Yeah. Roth Cornette mm-hmm. was with John Campia at the very beginning of Movie Talk. She helped him launch it. She was kind of his right hand, uh, kind of, I think, before Amy Rose. And she was the one that Screen Junkies recruited to kind of start their movie news channel. So not only have they started their own movie news, they actually took the person who was there with John by his side when he started it alongside Dennis as well. So that's, I thought for sure there might be some some issues there between all of them, but sure enough, Roth was on this past episode of Movie Talk, so I, I it must be a, a civil understanding. All, you know, what's the expression, all is fair, love and war? I'm, I'm butchering that, but... Wayne Grisky said that, right? I, who knows? But since they joined the movie-based competition in terms of games with the Schmodown, Movie Fights is a movie-based competition. Schmodown is a movie-based competition. Perhaps that is what put Screen Junkies over the top as far as making the leap into a space that has been owned by John Campia. So, staying on topic with Movie Talk, I actually now want to talk about the guy who stole the show. This was his week, Cody Miller. And I was not a guy who kept up with the Olympics, really. I, like, through the media, I guess I did, but I didn't get to watch a whole lot of the Olympics. So, I didn't really know much about him until JTE challenged him a few weeks back. Seeing him on Movie Talk, this could have gone either way, right? He's a he's a young guy. This isn't what he does for a living. I know he's a movie buff, but that doesn't mean you're necessarily good on the mic, whatever. This guy shows up and did a phenomenal job. I mean, I really didn't think that some people can just come on here, whether you're like a Hal Rudnick or someone who was a nightmare on Movie Talk, <laughs> can just come on there and just blow smoke, not say much of anything, just continue to echo what everyone else says. He really showed up, and I was really damn impressed with this guy, and I guess I should be. He's never given me a reason why I shouldn't be impressed with him, given the fact that he's an Olympic gold medalist, has a bronze medal, he's an Olympic swimmer. I mean, this guy is the real deal, and the fact that he can come on and do this for uh, two days with Collider. It was a lot of fun to watch, and I'm certainly happy that he came on. I just I just loved it. What did you think of Cody? Super likable guy, great energy. As you guys can tell, I'm big on energy, knows his stuff. Unfortunately, he's a big Harry Potter fan. That's one knock I've got against him, but okay. other than that, he's really a great guy. I mean, the only, if I, if I was to nitpick, because that's what we do on this show, the only thing that he probably should improve for when he comes back is to not say honestly so many times. That was the one, that was the one thing that I think more experience will help him out with. But besides that, he's a natural. He's an absolute natural. I sent him a tweet. I joked on Twitter, hey, Cody, if this whole swimming thing doesn't work out, at least you know you have a fallback plan now at Collider Video. So he appreciated that. He liked it and responded, et cetera. But yeah, great guest. And like you said, just because someone knows movies, that doesn't mean they're going to be a great guest on Movie Talk. We've seen plenty of people come in there and completely bomb. So this will be a very memorable moment when looking back uh, at some point as to when Jeremy Johns helps them get to 500,000, 700,000, and eventually a million. You're absolutely right about your tweet. Because everyone in that studio loved him. And without a doubt, if Cody Miller asked Dennis for a job, I guarantee he would have it. I guarantee it. Whether it be just a consistent movie talk panelist or whatever he wanted to do, I think he'd have it. And well-deserved, right? So I, I can't wait to see him come back. It was a lot of fun. Again, everyone loved him. Everyone was wearing his medals. He was constantly praised while he was there. And he brought the guys donuts, and he went to go see... uh, I saw him post that he went to go visit Amy Dallin at the... I can't think of what her comic book shop is right now. 
in LA, but like she went to go visit all, or he went to go visit all of those people. And I just thought that was super cool. He's a sweaty for this kind of stuff. Like we are just all around great experience. And I cannot wait to see him back, back on here again. So, Oh, well, I guess we will, we will next week. And we can talk a little bit about that when we get into the schmodowns. Cause you know, that's coming up. <laughs> By the way, this is a random question. If you won a gold medal, would you bring it to this studio and let people wear it all day? Would you let anyone touch it for that matter, let alone we'll let everybody in the studio try it on and wear it throughout a given day? If they were my medals, I would let Sinead hold it. <laughs> I would let Ellis and Christian hold it. Um, I would maybe let Riley hold it because he's, he's a champ. He knows what it's like to have the hardware. And if Roxy Stryer happened to be in the studio, I would let her hold it. Other than that, Roxy Star, as Campia pronounced her name. <laughs> when, when did he say that? Yeah, he would call her Roxy Star, even though it's Stryer. I always I found that funny. Also, I want to give Christian a hard time about his pronunciation of Jeremy. He says Jeremy when it's actually Jeremy. So. <laughs> Because Christian created such blatant misdirection this week in regards to our Jeremy Johns prediction, I'm going to give him a hard time more than I usually do. Love you, kid Christian. (laughs) I can't wait to hear him bring this up. What would he do without us? I mean, really? Really? What would he do without us? It's added something. I mean, the, the fact that people are kind of recapping our podcast on the show is so cool in itself. I mean, the fact, the fact that Brett said that he listens to our show every Sunday night, as does Christian, as does Riley, that's just, that's just cool. I was just being a douche on purpose. I don't actually feel that way. Did Brett say that, though? I didn't hear Brett say that. Yeah, they, they can't wait to watch it on Sunday night. Brett, what a sweetheart. Come on the show. If you're listening to this right now, you'll follow us on Twitter and let us know that you... Well, I guess I could just ask you. Brett, come on the show. I'd love to have you on, Okay. What a sweetheart. Yeah, I agree. I was, again, I was just being deduced before, but I think it's super awesome. And again, thank you to Christian and everybody who talks about us on there because it's it's a lot of fun hearing them talk smack about us. <laughs> That's for sure. You didn't notice his germy pronunciation? No. Well, I have a stupid accent. What do I know about how people talk? Good point. Touche. Touche. <laughs> okay. Let's move into... The rise and fall of JTE. So we've been waiting for several weeks, but I wasn't expecting it to drop so suddenly Thursday right before the live show. But I was able to catch it. From the opening credits, I realized that this is something truly special. The the opening graphics, I guess, not the credits. I think that this is a game changer, much like Jeremy John's. This is another reason why this is a pivotal week in Collider, because correct me if I'm wrong, but this is sort of the first, it's the first type of video done like this on the Collider video channel, correct? Well, it falls under the Collider original video umbrella. It's the first kind of long form version. Obviously, it's the first 30 for 30 uh, parody, but it does fall under the Mr. Sinister stuff and all the new original videos like the rap, like the behind the music version of the Collider News rap. That's all part of the same objective. Sure. So with Copster behind this, I think that this is a game changer totally. And I am super excited to see what else they can do because my overall thoughts on this are that it was great. Copster directed it, edited it. Uh, great narration by Ken Napsok. Cody wrote it. Amazing. Narration. Yeah. RB3 did the music. I think he even threw in um, an instrumental Fort Minor track, which I, <laughs> which I loved. <laughs> Shout out to Mike Shinoda. Uh, Ace didn't want any part of this because it wasn't animated. But overall, <laughs> it it was phenomenal. And not that I want to see a ton more of 30. I I would welcome any 30 for 30 that they want to do. But this, in my opinion, is not where it's going to stop. I think that the possibility are endless if they're able to create these type of more scripted videos. And we'll talk more about Copster on the live show portion for sure. But if he's able to stick around and do this full time, I mean, this, this is huge. This is huge. That plus the fact that it was just a great video, it makes it a total win, right? Yeah, I mean, not to keep referencing Riley, but 
he did say that they are putting an emphasis on these original videos. They're not going to overproduce a ton of them, but they're going to make them when they count. And obviously, Christian just put up a tweet, a poll as to what people want to see next as far as Schmodown 30 for 30 parodies. Roka and Mance is obviously the front runner right now. And if, if Roka wins this tournament, then he's definitely going to get the 30 for 30 treatment. But great job by Christian Chupacabra as far as directing and editing. <laughs> Ken's narration, absolutely brilliant. The Kangaroo Jack tangent was unbelievable. So random yep. and yet perfect. Cody, great job. RB3, great job. Uh, the performances specifically by Mark Ellis. Mark Ellis can act. All of those acting lessons that he took at Ashburn's Royal Acting Academy have really paid off. And my my only issue, I'd say, is that they didn't play up the decision enough in how JTE kind of backstabbed yeah. his defense attorney, Finstock. They kind of referenced it, but they could have mined that a bit more for more material. That was glaringly absent. I remember thinking it was very strange that it was glossed over. And just based on the footage of it, I mean, it just instantly jumped from sort of the Phase 5 and the After Buzz Studios to yeah. him being on the tag team on the same side as Chef Snyder. So it was like it was almost completely overlooked. I mean, Christian did reference the decision, but they could have gone into the tweet that he sent out to look for a new partner. There right. was there was more to mine there, but regardless, this was great. Makuga's crying was hilarious. I thought they overplayed that hand a little bit as Riley kind of did a, a, a crying bit right after that. And then Ellis, of course. But, but even though Ellis cried, his performance put everything he said beyond that over the top. Excellent, excellent job, everybody. As far as performances go, I actually want to give credit to Christian because... With Ellis, like we see all of these guys be themselves for the most part. They're not really ever acting. So to see Ellis act, yes, he is great at it, but we also know that it's Ellis acting. But Christian didn't really seem like he was acting. Like he had, a, he was a little going about it a different way. Uh, he wasn't as like praising JTE like everyone else was. Yeah, he was kid Christian. He, everyone else just kind of felt like they were sympathizing towards JTE a little bit because they wanted him to be a contender and they respected him. But Christian just kind of seemed like he didn't care. And I really liked that approach to foil everyone else. He also had the funniest line from the trailer, which is Christian's delivery was perfect. And I don't even know if it made it into the final edit because I didn't hear it. But when Christian says in the trailer, he just says things that don't make sense. Like, that cracked me up every time I heard it. And just hearing that type of cadence and his performance in the doc was really great. So Christian was my favorite part. Um, but, J but JTE and his ridiculous uh, poncho or whatever that was, he he looked obnoxious. <laughs> but he did a great job, too. I, I, I was impressed with his acting. Because, again, they mentioned that he had great lines. I thought his was, I mean, it could have just been him mispronouncing things or fumbling over his words, like when he's on the live show, but it wasn't. So just just a great job. And I'm very much looking forward to the very next thing they do, um, 30 for 30 or not. And I, I know what Riley said about um, putting an emphasis on these original videos. I think that's very important. I always have, and I'm really happy that they're doing it. But it's one thing to make an original video and sort of take this still traditional YouTube approach with the like who is Mr. Sinister type video like a lot of channels make those type of types of videos right so but the news wrap and the behind the music news wrap is in the same vein as this exactly that's what I'm saying so it's one thing for their originals to just be the who is Mr. Sinister and that's great but again this is something else and yeah you're absolutely right the rap is like that too but this this just set the bar and again Kudos to everyone involved who made this happen. The people in front of the camera, behind the camera, just great job. I think that response is universal. I haven't heard anyone say that they were displeased with it. So, you know, all the credit in the world goes to them. So thank you very much for the great content. guys. It's funny how some people did not realize Ken was joking when he said mispronunciation in regards to JTE. Some people thought that Ken screwed that up, but... Just another great detail from Ken, who is, again, absolutely brilliant in this video. And JTE's poncho made him look like a cross between Jabba the Hutt, Tony Sardusa, <laughs> and Tony Soprano in some ways. It was a very specific look. 
And, you know, he's not that big, but the poncho made him look huge, super wide. And uh, just just a great video, man. Shout out to Christian Chupacabra once again. Which is which is interesting because, you know, I thought you and Copster were going to start this little a feud up here. So well, we'll t- we'll talk about Copster in detail a bit later. And Uh-oh. my thoughts my my thoughts will become clear <laughs> at that point. Okay, um, that's kind of it for me on the Collider content this week. I thought it was just another great week in content. Uh, I actually watched most of it this week, with the exception of Nightmares. But I'm sure she did a great job. Clark Wolf always does. <laughs> but uh, yeah, not much to say. I know you want to talk about this thing on Jedi Council, which I realized it, but I want you to bring it up, bring it up because it pertains to you more than it does me. So yeah, so they finally, after like four weeks, when I first said this, they finally pronounced Michael Giacchino's name properly, the new composer for Star Wars Rogue One, and Christian made sure to kind of correct Riley, not correct Riley, but confirm to Riley that it is Giacchino. And there was this moment where Christian looks into the camera and I swear to God, man, it was like he, <laughs> he was staring into my soul as if to say, are you happy now, you son of a bitch? <laughs> like, I, I felt like he broke the fourth wall in a lot of ways just to look at me with that one specific look. Like, I can't explain it. Other than that, he actually looked into my eyes, into my soul, when he issued that final correct pronunciation of Giacchino. So I'm very happy. (laughs) Thank you, Christian. You're one of the few platforms to actually get it right. So I'm glad I could be a part of it. That's sort of how I felt the week where he kept calling me Ryan. Every time he did it, he looked into the camera and just said, Ryan. And I watched that. I was watching it with my mom and we were cracking up at how like it was funny, but also kind of eerie because, again, it felt like he was looking into my soul and talking directly to me. But when they said that, I instantly knew that they were talking about you. It's not it's not the first time that happened this week. What what should have happened, though, is. Christian should have given us a little plug because, you know, we are a Collider video after show, too, right? Yeah. For some reason, they uh, they they address us sparingly on the Collider side of things. Maybe, maybe Campia will shout us out. Campia likes us, right? Campia. Campia. That's right. We'll get Campia and Johns to talk about us on a movie Damn talk it. next. Snelling, stop it. That one I did do on purpose. Um, I just want to you- say, besides besides that... My only other thought regarding their programming this week was that I, I'm kind of disappointed we didn't get a full season spoiler discussion of Luke Cage. They did the mini reviews, but like Daredevil, they wrapped it all up with a season worth of discussion where everybody sits on, sits in on a panel. And for some reason, they didn't do that. I know schedules have been crazy. I mean, some people were supposed to do the final three episodes of Luke Cage on Sunday night, but the Vegas traffic got in the way of that, apparently, per my understanding. So hopefully they'll still do a Luke Cage full season recap at some point where everybody kind of weighs in, gives their grade like they did for Daredevil season two. Even though I was a champion for the TV recaps, I think they should do them. For me personally, and I'm curious to hear what other people's tendencies were with this, I would watch like three episodes of Luke Cage, and then I would quit the Netflix and then watch the three recaps. Um, I I don't know. I, I couldn't find, I didn't find myself willing to stop after every episode to watch it, but I still think it's important. Um, I, I would kind of maybe like more of a long form recap, and I know that they're trying to binge and that's fine, but like... 10 to 15 minutes maybe of actually talking more in depth about the episode instead of just being like, yo, that was great. And I love that. And it was just, it's really, really simple. So if there was like a happy medium between a like super long form review of an episode versus what they did here, uh, that would be for me. I don't know how everyone else responded to it. Let me know in the comment section, how you guys watch these recap episodes, whether it be after every single episode of Luke Cage or after every few, like I did, but the, they covered the finale. It was just Campia. I thought that that was a little... <laughs> that would have been the wrong one to see just one person on. That's why I want the full panel discussion because, exactly. no offense to Griffin and Medina, but our main personalities did not cover the majority of these episodes. So I want to see everyone discuss it together with Schnepp, with Dennis, with John, with Christian, with Ellis, and uh, kind of get 
a feel for what everybody thought. Yes, we got a recap spoiler discussion on TV Talk, but everybody loves this genre across the board in that office. So I want to get everybody at the same table to kind of put a close to the Luke Cage coverage for this year. I was so embarrassed last weekend because Luke Cage, I think it was Saturday while I was at work. Luke Cage had been out for like a day or two. Collider had already done some of their recaps. And it made me remember Michael Medina and his coverage of San Diego Comic-Con. And I tweeted at him asking him when he was going to be on Collider video again because it had been a while. And he favorited the tweet and then just never responded. So part of me was like, you know what? I bet if I open up one of these Luke Cage recaps, he's going to be on it. And sure enough, he did have a couple of the recaps, and I was so embarrassed. And I had to tweet back at him like, hey, I'm stupid. The The point still stands. I like to see Michael Medina on more content because uh, I like him. So there's that. Are you ready to get into Schmodown? Sure am. Let's talk about Wolves of Steel versus Team Heroes on uh, Tuesday's match. First off, this reminds me of The Decision. Because the decision is probably one of my favorite things to happen in Phase 6 to date. And the opening tease at the beginning of this match reminded me of that. Because it was just so much fun. This was the not only the debut of Robert Meyer Burnett, but it's the debut of Wolves of Steel as a team, right? Yeah. So, this was a lot of fun. Not to mention, I watched this later than... Well, I didn't watch it immediately, I guess. So I actually caught some of the Robert Meyer Burnett Clark Wolf Twitter feud. Did you see any of this? I did. I did. But that I think that happened before the match even dropped. Yeah, it did. Regardless, that was very interesting because I like Robert Meyer Burnett. I like him a lot, actually. And when I was doing Film Beef, I tried to get him on... And we had some really interesting <laughs> conversations between the two of us. Nothing, nothing bad, nothing horrible, but just some really weird conversations um, that I probably talked about before on this podcast. But it was just funny to see Robert Meyer Burnett probably say something that he shouldn't have. I don't know that I have a problem with what he said because I originally thought he was always joking, but obviously I'm not a woman, so Clark Wolf. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm saying that it's not as easily for me to be offended by that as it is for a woman. Am I saying that right? Am I being insensitive? I'm not meaning to. I'm saying there's a reason why Clark Wolf would be offended, is what I'm saying, over me. No, I, I, get, I get what you're saying. But I wasn't trying to talk poorly about Clark or be misogynist or whatever. I'm just saying that it would take someone like Clark Wolf for me to realize, hey, maybe he shouldn't have said that. That's what I'm meaning. Right. It, w- it was in bad taste, and he's admitted that. That was interesting, only because it made me realize that we don't get to see it a lot on screen, but it's very likely that these like these people that we watch from week to week might not actually have the best relationships in person, and you would never know it. But, you know, moving forward, that's... I don't know if Clark and Robert Meyer Burnett made up, and I don't know how many other times that people on Collider Video have actually had altercations like this, maybe in the public eye or not. And it just goes to show that it's not always smooth sailing over there. And I just found that very... But she barely barely works with him. She barely works with him. They don't have a close relationship. If it was someone like Perry or Riley, whom she sees every day and works with, then I'd be... A, a bit concerned, but yeah, Robert Meyer Burnett, he said something in poor taste. I was kind of taken aback by it, and uh, she called him out on it. He apologized, and uh, that's that. Yeah, I wasn't trying to amplify it in that way. I just found it interesting. It made me think that there are probably a million other instances similar to this that have happened that we're just not privy to because it didn't happen in the public eye. I just thought it was an interesting thought, but Clark is no pushover. That's true. She's not. Let's talk about the actual match now. Um, You know, in the first round, it was obvious to me that there are particular weaknesses on the team. And I thought in round one, Clark was sort of the weakness. And Schnepp didn't really show up either. And it reminded me of his match versus Finstock, where I thought he just threw in the towel so many times it didn't even want to try. Um, I thought that was interesting. Riley started off strong and uh, Robert Meyer Burnett had a strong first round too but uh overall 
I don't know what you want to talk about, really. Overall, I think it, it was the wheel that gave them the win, Team Hero. Round, round two continues to be make or break for these matches. Round one, people get off to a slow start. No one was really uh, jumping out of the gates. It was 4-2 Wolves at the end of round one. But round two, based on the wheel, that's when things truly change. And um, yeah, I just want to say I was kind of annoyed by the fact that at the end of each round, each team would be talking over yeah. the announcers or while the announcers were talking. And Christian gave this look that reminded me of the look that he gave Sasha at the end of the Sea in France interview where he kept getting cut, cut off when he kept trying to kind of put a bow on the interview. So um, I could just see Christian boiling in that you moment. You love bringing up that moment. But the thing that I didn't get is that that's something that could have just been edited out. You would think they'd be able to cut that track of audio out, yes, but... Because not only is it them talking to each other, but it's Christian trying to talk. So Christian kept stopping himself. So it was basically mumbling versus bumbling. So they could have just taken out that entire section and no one would have known about it. Because they talk about recording different takes on the Schmodown. And just like me and you do on this podcast, sometimes we have to do a different take. Like, why not? Just... Uh, that's what that's what I had a problem with. I had a problem that it wasn't edited out, not because that it actually happened. So, but but back to the match. I mean, the difference is usually the wheel in round two. I mean, Team Heroes got comic books and Wolves got '90s movies. They passed on Cameron Diaz, of course, and this is how they brought the match back to twelve to ten at the end of round two. Both teams surprisingly missed Stanley's cameo. Uh, But yeah, the wheel gives teams that are out of it a chance to jump back in a hurry, especially when the opponent draws a category they are weak in. And then the first question, the one pointer for Burnett, Team Heroes, thin blue line quickly corrected himself, thin red line. Do you think there's any controversy there? Would you have accepted it if you were the one announcing? I think I would have accepted it. It wasn't like, it wasn't. There wasn't a lot of time between the correction. It was instant. Maybe if Christian or Cambia got out that it was incorrect while he was still speaking, then maybe. It was almost like a move in chess where Robert Mario Burnett still had his hand on the piece before he actually let go, right? Because he was still talking. That's how I look at it. Yeah, if if maybe another second passed, then there would be a case to uh, shoot it down. But Thin Blue Line apparently is a movie itself, so... Um, if, if another second passed, they could have not given him that point. Very possible. Uh, Schnepp is all over the place, really, in this competition as a whole. But um, he asked for the rules on the five-pointer. I guess you can confer with your, your teammate on the five-pointer. I don't know if that's the case on the one and three-pointer. Can you confirm one way? So they choose which player answers the one, and then they choose the other player will answer the three, and then both answer the five. Okay, so five's the only one where you can confer with your with your partner, and they got they got a great uh, question for their five pointer: which movie did J Law win an Oscar for? Silver Linings Playbook. They're up sixteen to twelve. Clark gets her one pointer related to Meryl Streep, and she doesn't get it. To one pointer, didn't get the question. They're still down sixteen twelve. Riley gets that big three pointer in Edward Nigma sixteen fifteen. Then the five-pointer, once again, we've got another name, two of the three films that Sergio Leone did with Clint Eastwood, and Riley couldn't do it, which which shocks me. Yeah. Especially because he studied film. I agree. I was shocked that he couldn't get that, because The Good and the Bad, The Ugly is the most popular film, and yet he could get Fistful of Dollars, right? So I just thought that was very interesting, and... I don't know. I, I had a problem with one of the questions or one of the answers, excuse me, in round two, the the Boondock Saints. The fact that they asked who played the father and they went multiple choice. The guess of Willem Dafoe, who's clearly not the father in that movie. I just thought that was uh, a poor, educated guess. And the fact that Riley and Clark are on tilt right now. They are both struggling for reasons that will become clear in a few minutes. But both of them went from heavy favorites overall tag team and singles to uh, being on major losing streaks between the two of them what i'll say i mean clark is, clark has lost three straight matches what i'll say is that 
if Team Heroes didn't get comic book movies, there's no way they win. The Of course not. Wolves of Steel was supposed to be a powerhouse. They fell flat in their first match, and it was just really disappointing. But did you have a problem yourself with the phrasing of any of the questions? Because that's what something that Riley brought up to Makuga at the end of the match. He had a problem with the twofers, which you addressed. But did you have a problem with any of the phrasing? I never heard any question that sounded like it was phrased poorly. You can pick apart these questions all day long. But yeah, the only issue, though, that I really have is when you have to recall multiple films in the most important question of the night, the five-pointer. And that's just that's just not fair, especially when your opponent may not have to do that. They may just have to name Mrs. Doubtfire as the, their five-pointer. So it's really unfair to have to think of not one, but two answers, or in, in Clark's case, four out of five characters or five characters from Guardians of the Galaxy. So I really wish they would do away with multiple answer questions. Or at least to make sure that they have them categorized for harder questions, whether it be the three-point or the five-point in round three, or just in round three in general, because that's where you can put the harder questions. So that's just that's just my thing. Sure. Um, is there any chance that Heroes beats Team Patriots? None. That's, that's sort of what I thought. I, I, I don't think Schnepp is ever a contender. Yes, he, he can get the comic book stuff, but that's such a small portion of what the Schmodown really is. He probably has random knowledge of other things, but Schnepp has never been a threat to me. Again, I thought that they got lucky. I like Schnepp, but... You really think they're going to draw comic books again in their next match via right. the wheel? No way. The last thing I want to bring up, though, is that the more that the Schmodown is viewed... The more matches that exist, the newcomers like Robert Mario Burnett, that those type of people will be more and more interesting to me. Because Campia said that Robert Mario Burnett said he was looking at a tank of minnows when he was watching these old Schmodown matches. So think of like how we perceive the Schmodown, right? Me and you. I know that I would do horribly in the Schmodown because I can sort of gauge my knowledge based on watching all these matches. There's someone out there in this space that has watched all these matches and has known the majority of the questions that have been asked. And then they can just raise their hand or ask Christian like, hey, I can come in and do this easily. So people like Robert Meyer Burnett that are coming in now in Phase 6 and people that are coming in in the future, those people are going to be very interesting to watch. That's I don't know. Do do you see do you see what I'm saying with that? Do you agree with me? Yeah, but at the same time, it's easy for us watching from our computer screens to say how well we would do when the pressure's not on us, the lights aren't on us. I think I would do very well in this competition, except for animation. That is my my weakness, but I would prepare for it. But when you're under the lights with the cameras rolling, with Josh McCuga staring at you in the audience. That's when you might buckle under the pressure. I must say, though, I like that other people are adopting Josh McCuga's strategy to use the clock to its utmost potential, to ask for the question to be repeated. A lot of people are using that strategy now, and that's a point that I made to Riley a few weeks ago. I said, why aren't other people doing what Josh does to get themselves some extra time to get rid of that nervous energy um, that you have initially when you know that the clock is ticking. I just watched Beverly Hills Cod for the first time last night, so what do I know? Oh my Um, god. I I thought of you when uh, uh, Makuga came out of the curtain, though, because it looked like he had just finished up a quickie there, putting on his jacket (laughs) and bringing out the wheel, but... Okay, let's talk again about Riley and Roka in the last semifinal match of the Ultimate Schmodown Tournament. Again, just to kind of echo what I said, Riley was a little bit disappointing. And we are watching Roka on this trajectory that is just fascinating. Like, Outlaw Nation has just surged in the past 24 hours. They now have a shirt for him on the Schmo's no uh, T public page, which I guess he's the second or third person to have a t shirt from the Schmodown, one being Wolves of Steel and the second being Team Patriots, and now it's just Roka. So I don't know. What did you what did you think of this match? Well, I knew from the first question, first or second question, that this was not Riley's night. I could just tell right away that there was something off. I knew that Roka was gonna win. 
Riley got some really hard questions at the start of the match, while Roka got some very easy questions at the start of the match. However, late in the match, Riley started getting some easy questions, especially in round three, but he didn't connect on them. And Roka connected when it mattered. Obviously, the outcome is, is really no surprise based on uh, the way things started. And like I said, Riley is on tilt right now. Clark is on tilt right now. Um, both were heavy favorites, but Roka, he's, a, he's been a man on a mission. He is determined to win this. And Riley, though, great guess in round one with Michelle Pfeiffer's branch of service in Dangerous Minds, the Marines. That was an amazing yeah, guess. Sure. I mean, that was one question that he got after his first turn, which was one to nothing before it went over to uh, to Roka. And I love Mark Ellis throwing in a Bespin call from the crowd. That was priceless. <laughs> But Roka went for three for three as soon as his first turn was up in round one. So, again, Roka was determined. Uh, Riley kind of came back a little bit in his second turn in round one. He was, uh, that's a candy man question, Patton, finding Forrester. He was up four three, but, but man, I mean, it just, did, it just didn't feel like it was ever going Riley's way. Yeah, I mean, again, Riley just didn't finish a round ahead, and... It's getting to the point where it's almost like it's not even worth speculating who's going to win anymore because the the top tier titans, say that fast three times, have just kind of fallen. And all these other people are rising and it's just getting to the point where it's just anybody's game now, and it, which is making it exciting. I'm not saying it's not exciting, but it, it sucks when you have... Am I exaggerating too much on how I feel about this? No, I mean, you're right, but I mean... The questions that you have to answer correctly, you cannot screw those up. I mean, the easy questions that you get, there's no room for error. And Riley did not get those easy questions this episode. I mean, Tilda Swinton in Trainwreck, that is a question that he needs to answer. He cannot take multiple choice on Jason Schwartzman in Funny People. He got the band yeah. manager question right in regards to Paul Rudd in This Is 40. Roka wasn't happy about the fact that they gave him that band manager uh, answer when he was like a record executive. But um, any issue with that that question, by the way? I actually don't, but I see why it's controversial. Yeah, it was kind of a stretch, but you got to get those those easy questions when they come your way. If you don't get your easy questions... Someone like Roka is going to make you pay because Roka can get the tough questions. Uh, he's got enough viewing history under his belt. Uh, he's a bit older than some of the competitors, so he's got uh, kind of a wealth of knowledge that some people don't have just in terms of the number of years that he's been watching all this stuff. Will you be buying an Outlaw Nation shirt? Absolutely not. <laughs> what do you think? We get a break from the Ultimate Schmodown tournament next week because we're going to be watching Cody Miller versus JTE. Very quickly, I'd just like to hear your thought process in this match. Who do you think is going to come out on top? It's hard to say. Um, obviously, I'm on record. I think JTE's got a belt in his future once he stops the shenanigans and just focuses on the actual competition. But Cody's no slouch, so I just want a good match. I, I don't really want to pick a winner. It's This is more of an exhibition, obviously, because of Cody's involvement, but I just want to see a good match. And based on their banter on the live show, I think it's going to be an entertaining match as well. I hope so. I hope so. And I, I'm assuming that they recorded the match yesterday while Cody was in town and JTU was hanging out. Absolutely. Um and again, after the fact that they had that banter on the live show, I'm hoping that they carried into yesterday's recording. I don't think there's a chance Cody wins this. I think it's a lot of fun. You're right. It's just an exhibition. But JTE has age. He has experience. Cody has never done this before. He's younger. I just, it's going to be fun, but I don't think there's a chance in hell that Cody wins it and actually i think if cody does win it i might start to think that the schmodown is rigged i'm just kidding it would make a great redemption arc the beginning of a great redemption arc if jte beat an olympian that would be kind of a great moment to add to his reel but just to button up riley and roca you know riley when it came to round three there were questions like what what is the name of the under siege sequel that's a question he needs to answer just because 
that movie was popular in his heyday, Dark Territory. He named Fire Down Below, which is another Steven Seagal film. Can't Hardly Wait, a huge comedy in our day. That's a question he needs to get right for three points. So the questions that were served to him on a silver platter, he just did not get. And Roca made him pay. That, that Oblivion question was a little bit weird, though. They called Cruz a security guard, which isn't quite accurate. He was, he was like an astronaut. He would repair uh, drones or droids. It was very minimally worded. I get what you're saying. I knew the answer just because I'd seen Oblivion. Obviously, it's in my recent memory. So I, yeah. I, I get what you're saying. There's nothing about that question that makes you think of a science fiction film first. So I actually kind of think that's right. hard, but I actually think the wording of the question is still somewhat accurate. It's just not really helpful, if that makes sense. So I can kind of see it go either way. I would have gotten it right, but in no way am I saying that Roka is an idiot for getting it wrong, because that, that is a tough question. And when you compare that to the Mrs. Doubtfire question, an unemployed divorce actor or whatever it was... Uh, this is a bit more misleading than that Mrs. Doubtfire question in terms of how it's phrased. Um, are you ready to get into the live show? Or did you want to bring up... Oh, hold on. No, I want you to talk about this. So we talked about Jedi Council, Christian and Riley. We're talking about you, talking about Giacchino. Somebody else might have indirectly mentioned you at the end of the Schmodown. Do you want to address this? Well, there were a couple weird things that went on. First off, Josh McCuga was making comments from the <laughs> peanut ga gallery all episode, or all match, and yet he didn't bring out the wheel. Mark Ellis brought out the wheel. So Josh McCuga is present, and yet, for some reason, he passes on bringing out the wheel for probably the first time ever. So that's very strange. And then when it comes time to do the interviews... Josh is very subdued, and he points out the fact that he's wearing a boring suit. And he was explaining how a fan gave him a hard time for wearing loud suits. So, I'm going to take credit for this and act like Josh was doing all this in response to uh, some of the criticism that I've given the wild man of late. For him to pass on the wheel, for him to pass on a loud suit, for him to pass on his usual enthusiasm and shtick... I think I've gotten under the wild man's skin, wouldn't you say? Or excuse me, I think I've gotten under the wild man's fur, if you will. I think that these are actually two instances where they are actually responding to something that we've said. Now, there have been other episodes of Schmoville Podcast where we speculated that they're responding to something that was said on here that I don't always think is the case, right? But these two instances... I immediately thought of you both times before we even came together and we're like, hey, did you mention this? Or did you happen to catch this? So these two specific instances, yes. And this Schmodown probably would have been recorded a couple of weeks ago when our episode aired, right? So I think you might have gotten under his fur a little bit. So I think he's trying to prove a point that the alternative of the wild man is... Very subdued, not as entertaining, and he's going to make me wish that we still had the wild man persona. So I see what you're doing, Josh, and I like it. I respect it. Uh, I was actually ready to transition to the live show, but I want to talk about Imagine That real quick on the Schmoes Note channel. So if you guys don't know, they put out this new series. It's sort of like a video essay type in the vein of... Uh, what like Mr. Sunday Movies does, or Screen Rant does a lot of these types of videos... Imagine that they did uh, imagine if Tom Cruise was Iron Man and they it was like several minutes of just talking about what the MCU might be like, what the movie might be like. And I liked it. I, I'm glad. Again, I like that the Schmoes No Channel is expanding a little bit on their content. Yes, I'm still wanting more uh, some of a, a long form of Mark and Christian, but this will do for now. And the guys over at Collider are actually helping them make this video. Christian produces the video, puts it together. Um, Aaron, who does the Schmodown, edits the video. And then Joe, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, he writes them. I actually don't know who this is. I've never heard this guy mentioned ever 
Joe Ruggerella, formerly known as Shoesy Pants, used to be a Schmoes No intern. Okay. And uh, he had a, a feud with JTE when JTE was still Josh the intern, JTI. And so uh, it's it seems like they've enlisted the help of their former intern. I'm not sure where he works now, uh, but it's kind of cool that they're bringing him back on board to do some work. They're going to do these videos like once a month, Christian said. So I don't know. I'm looking forward to see what else they can do with this. What did you think overall of the Imagine That video? I liked it. It kind of reminds me of John Schnepp's What Happened movie about the the death of Superman Returns, whatever it is. The death of Superman lives. What happened? T-D-S-O-L-W-H.com or however the hell he says The worst acronym ever, but (laughs) I'm still wondering why Schnepp hasn't made a TV series that explores other films that were in production and yet fell out of production while while in the early stages. So it kind of reminds me of that, only more preliminary stuff like what if Tom Cruise was cast. And I was hoping they would include this one point this one image that kind of proves how tom cruise would want to have his face showing through the iron man mask and that of course is edge of tomorrow he's wearing this big bulky suit in edge of tomorrow and sure enough his face is fully visible in that film even though there's such violent stuff taking place around him that you would think you'd want your face covered in that type of battle so that proved their point right there why he would want this, and yet they overlook putting that in. So it's a minor detail, it's a minor nitpick, but it does prove that uh, Cruz really did have this note and suggestion to producers. Yeah, it reminded me of the spacesuits in the latest Star Trek movies, when in the first one where they're diving onto the mining part of the ship, and Chris Pine has the the sort of the faceless helmet or whatever. That's sort of what I thought Iron Man would now look like. Um, but anyway, yeah, I'm glad that they're making this, this type of video. So great job, guys. Can't wait to see what else you do. Are you ready to go to the live show now? Absolutely. So this is something I know you want to talk about, but do you want to talk about right out of the gate? I mean, are you ready to talk about Miri, or do you want to go through some other stuff before we get to the big stuff? Well, we can go through some some other stuff first before we get to the the big topics like Miri. So, obviously, we had that very giggly intro. Yeah, they they were high as shit, weren't they? I'm not going to say that, but it reminds me a lot of Christian in, in Phase Three. Christian in Phase Three uh, was always laughing a lot more. He was drinking a lot more than during the shows, but it reminded me so much of that of that energy. And I'll kind of expand on that later, but. Um, this felt like the old school days of Schmo, just based on how Christian was reacting. Well, let's explain on it now, because this is something that I said to you during the live show, is that Christian was such a huge bullet point for this episode. Because, again, like you said, he had so much energy, he was loose. I actually don't think they were really that intoxicated for the show, I was joking. But there was something that was a little more youthful about it and it was like he just was really into the show and because of that I was really into it even though I had no idea what they were laughing at at the top I was laughing I was having a lot of fun immediately and there was just something about this that just set the tone entirely and that's why I loved this entire episode of the live show is because it started out so strong it was always funny it was always a good time and, you know, they also started off making fun of us, which is always funny and interesting, right? What did you think of Christian's impressions of us? Well, the strange thing is, though, before we get to that, is during the giggling, Miri's actually crying to begin the show. So everybody's kind of laughing and she's kind of tearing up. So a lot of weird emotions were taking place at the very intro of the show. Yeah, so I saw that. So I don't know what the hell was going on before then. But do you think that they were trying to make Miri cry? Maybe it was some kind of like cr- game to see who could get her to cry? Or do you think it was just something funny that was said beforehand? Perhaps. Maybe Cody was uh, screwing around. Maybe JT and Ken were screwing around already. Maybe they were there already. I don't know. But yeah, Krishna addressed this pretty quick. He did his standard impression that he gives for anyone that gives criticism to the show. 
uh, that same old voice that he applies. Obviously, he did clarify that doesn't actually sound like me, at least I hope not. But um, yeah, it's, it's great to uh, to get mentions like that. He finally gave me credit for the Miri prediction that I made on Schmoville number 20, my first episode. Finally, he's finally giving me credit. He's not creating misdirection or deflecting. He's finally giving me credit. And what was strange is it was actually before Miri had even approached them about leaving. Yeah. So I called it before she'd even given them official notice. She looked pretty impressed by that. She was like, yeah. oh, did he really make that prediction? That's crazy. Because I'm sure she made the decision before that. She just didn't tell them for a little bit. But um, yeah, that was that was a kind of a cool moment. You mentioned Roka's age earlier when we were talking the Schmodown. The fact that Brett is older than Copster's dad, and Makuga <laughs> mentioned that JTE is older than him in the Rise and Fall JTE, I realized that all of these people's ages are totally ambiguous. Doesn't that, don't those blow your mind? Are we sure about JTE's age? I feel like they were purposely putting out random numbers to... Just to kind of make fun of him. Like, I don't really know what age he truly is. Well, the the joke was, I think in this rundown, that he was born in 1953. So, I don't know. I guess Makuga, technically Makuga could have been just playing off of that joke. But I don't know if he would have been privy to Knapsack's narration before his interview. So, when Makuga said that JTE was older than him, I actually think it's probably true. And how old is Makuga? Makuga is like 36. Oh, I believe that, but he's certainly not as old as what they were putting out there besides that. So doesn't that blow your mind that JTE is older than Makuga and Brett is older than Copster's dad? Because Copster is my age. Yeah, you guys are both like 22 years old, so. I'm, t- I'm almost 26. Almost 26, Brian. Copster's what, 24? I thought he was 25. I thought me and him were the same age. I know me and Ace are the same age. Where's Ace? I don't know what he's doing. I miss Ace. Where's Ace? Where the heck is Ace? Where in the world is Ace Cabrera? Also, let me just address something. They called me out for my show title branding speculation. I said, uh, I'm, I, I would venture to say that Complex Collider suggested that they change the title of the show. I never said that they didn't want to make that change. I absolutely believe that they wanted to make the change as well. I still think that Complex slash Collider nudged them in that direction because they were also acquiring Collider Movie Talk. They were also creating a Film HQ type show, which was still in development at that point, not necessarily with Campia yet, but it's a very specific change that I can absolutely see a corporation getting behind to differentiate all these different shows because you've got 12 movie related shows it's important to kind of create one that is more pop culture more lifestyle so i still think they got a suggestion a a gentle nudge in that direction and they liked the idea and went with it so they're not going to give me the truth either way but i still stick to my belief that it was suggested to them what did you think about miri talking about her experience with pole dancing That was uh, interesting. Uh, That caught me by surprise. It was not what I was expecting on her final episode, certainly. But uh, if you look around the room, everybody was just hanging on her every word. They were. uh, As she's describing all this. But yeah, who knew that the mom and the guest is a famous pole dancing instructor. And we were lucky enough to get Christian's reaction to all that, which is priceless. There were a ton of things that hinted at... Um, more Whispergate speculation from this week, by the way. And I know you talked about that. Me and you talked about that earlier in the week uh, with two different instances, though. Uh, two different examples of that this week. Um, but they were priceless, for sure. Um, again, Cody Miller. And I think I said this either last week or the week before, how I wanted to bring up the name again, the Schmoes No Show, to be more... Just to stick to that and not just talk about movies. And the opportunity to have Cody Miller on was phenomenal. He was one of the most engaging guests that they have ever had. And and you could tell, again, everyone was hanging off of every word that he said when he came on. He was genuine. He was natural behind the mic. uh, Extremely relatable. 
I love the stuff how we talked about like his medical disadvantage. Again, I haven't heard any of that because I didn't watch the Olympics and I didn't do a whole lot of research on who he was. It's just, again, this guy, I was so happy to have him come on the live show as well. And he, again, really took the spotlight away from Jeremy Johns <laughs> because we were able to learn so much more about him. Somebody brought up his celebrity lookalike. Do you remember what who that was? Somebody said he looked like a celebrity. Well, they tried to suggest that S- Sebastian Stan would play him in a in a film, but he, I can't get out of my head. He looks like someone I went to college with, and that's all I think of when I see him. So I really can't picture anyone else as him but my friend from college. Yeah, the question was who would play him in a movie, and I thought I think Sebastian Stan. Right, I think he looks like a young Christian Slater. A younger Christian Slater could work. I'll, I'll have to think about that. Do you see that? <laughs> I would love to see Christian Slater play Cody Miller in a movie. That'd be fantastic. It's important to give some context to something, though. The Pierce Morgan question, I don't think people understood why Christian was asking that. There's they a didn't re- really expand on what was actually asked from Piers Morgan. I didn't really hear him explain it very well. That's the thing. This is what happened. Cody won the bronze medal for the 100-meter breaststroke. And he was celebrating like crazy in the pool after winning a bronze medal. So that's what Pierce Morgan was criticizing on Twitter when he acted like people shouldn't be celebrating after winning a bronze. It's either gold or nothing. I'm not quoting him exactly, but that is why Cody took offense to what Pierce said. That's why Christian was calling him such a dope and a a ball bag. It was because he called them out for celebrating. And Cody, you know, wisely explained, I've been working for this my whole life, getting a medal, getting any sort of hardware after this medical condition that I've had is something that I'm proud of, whether it's gold, silver, or bronze. Right. Yeah, that is pretty, pretty lame. And this makes me really wish that I was paying more attention to the Olympics because I really was pulling for Cody when he was explaining that argument. Like, I instantly took his side, and I realized it would have been a lot more fun to actually watch him in the Olympics than it would be to just root for him on the Schmozo live show about something that had happened months ago. So it kind of makes me regret paying attention to him a little bit more. But uh, The banter with JT is a classic moment already. You won't have Michael Phelps to win you a medal. You're stepping into my dojo. I've been watching movies my whole life. And then the greatest line of the episode, the Schmodown has proven that you can't win individual matches. That shut JTE down. JTE did not know how to respond to that. It was a mic drop moment for Mr. Cody Miller. It was great. I was laughing my ass off. I couldn't believe how, because I believed them that they just met at that point because JTE would have just been coming from screen junkies. Now, I guess they might have said hey to each other during the break right. or whatever, but I truly believe that that was their first yeah. conversation. And the fact that Cody was so comfortable already talking shit. Unfortunately, again, I think JTE is going to show up during the match and be able to win. But this was, like you said, one of the best moments and I loved it. And I'm sure Christian was loving the hell out of it too. So that's something that's exactly what right. Christian wants out of his Schmodown contenders. So that was really great. Um, America basically invented pools. Have you heard of the ocean? Yes, they used to swim in the ocean. So so great. JT getting called out left and right. That's that's always fun for sure. Um, next up in my notes is all about Mary, and I want you to be able to talk about Mary because you have more to say about her than I do. Rasika asked me to make a video for that, and I totally blew it. I got really busy. So I just want to say, Miri, I've said it before on here, but I'll say it again, because apparently you don't listen to our show because she <laughs> didn't know what me and you sounded like when Christian did our impression, but that's okay. Um, Miri, uh, we're going to miss you. Uh, I hate to see you go because I've enjoyed so much of Phase 6, and I know that you are very instrumental in that. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get to know you even more, but you obviously are beloved by so many people. Um, I wish you the best of luck in everything else that you do. and. Uh, I'm sorry that I didn't get the video made in time. Brian Davids, what do you have to say to Miri Jedekin? Yeah, I've been a huge fan since I first saw her on AMC in in 2014. And I, again, she's the matriarch of Schmoes. Katie is the queen of Schmoville, but we're going to look back at Miri as the matriarch. And great video by RB3, although I think he hung a bit too long on the Christian and Miri uh, gazes at each other. (laughs) 
and that kind of drove the <laughs> Schmoville infidelity hounds crazy. That's a that's a Facebook group now. The, the the infidelity hounds they have their own Facebook group. I was just joking. So yeah, the infidelity hounds probably went crazy when they saw that part. But overall, I'm not too pleased with something because last week she explained that there's only one of her, or a couple weeks ago she explained there's only one of her. She's got this production company that she supposedly does stuff for and she's got this hit fix show and she's got this girl on film show that she does with alicia and uh i wasn't too pleased that she brought up thr even though you and i brought up thr last week she had done some emmy stuff for them but she voiced how she hopes that it becomes something more so i thought it was kind of in bad taste to say there's only one of me and yet I hope that this third job becomes more than just what it is now when she's apparently too busy to produce one show per week at night. So clearly she's got the time for the show. She just wants to do other things, other things that she deems to be uh, bigger, better, who knows. But, you know, at the end of the day, I still value her contributions to the show. I'm going to miss her. Uh, she brought a lot, obviously, in terms of the vibe, and I'm, I don't want to say organization again, but things did seem to be rolling quite well. It wasn't the controlled chaos of Phase 3 or Phase 5, but uh, it still had its own miri type feel that we'll, all, we'll always remember. But I really think the rush hour traffic is the biggest issue here. I think if she lived closer to Collider Video's studio or Collider Studio, I don't think she'd be leaving. I really think, like she said, I think the drive was just too much after a while. And she's willing to do other things that are more convenient to her. So THR is probably more convenient to where she lives. But I think after a while, given her family, given these other opportunities, I just think she couldn't she couldn't take it anymore. And so nothing nothing is supposed to last forever, especially in this space. But I do think she still had the time if things were a bit more convenient for her. So um, either way, I'm going to miss her. For sure. Um, the video was funny because there was a guy <laughs> dressed up as Kylo Ren in it. I don't know what that guy's doing. <laughs> and there was a lot of Sasha, and I found that very interesting. I didn't realize, because I'm more of a newbie, I didn't realize how much Sasha had been in the other phases. I really had no idea. I thought she was mainly prevalent now. So that kind of blew my mind a little bit. Yeah, Phase 5 brought on Alicia, Miri, Sasha. So that was a, a big turning point. I've got, I've got some more points to make on Sasha, but I'm going to hold back on those. And people, I don't know if everyone, you know, I don't know if everyone listening truly understands what LA rush hour traffic is like. So when I say the traffic is enough to make someone leave a job like this, Believe me, folks, it is enough to make someone leave a job as great as being the Schmozno show producer is. So don't take that lightly just because I'm bitter that she has another job besides the two that she mentioned. So it is a significant, significant soul-sucking time spent, for lack of a better phrase. What's interesting about you wanting to talk about Sasha is so several people in the comment section from last week's episode were like, well, I'm just so tired of them talking about Sasha. No more Sasha, please. And they were still talking about how they dislike Sasha after we tried very hard to get that to go away. <laughs> so I've never seen a woman criticize Sasha in the YouTube comments. It's always male viewers. Always. Well, you can't always tell who's hiding behind some of those uh, default YouTube pictures where it's just like the cutout of the person's head, but it always seems to be male. I agree with you. So. I, again, just speaking for myself, I've never seen a woman commenter bash Sasha. It's typically got it's typically guys. You can tell they're guys the way they talk, etc. And there's definitely a gender issue, and people who deny that are, are just being naive. They're just being naive because you've got male personalities on this show that act the same way and do more over the top things than she does and they don't get anywhere near the criticism that she gets it's it's truly it's it's truly sad and i just i don't know i just i wish that we didn't have to keep talking about this she brings an energy that is so rare so unique 
and I'll I'll expand on this a bit more in a second. I'm holding back for a reason. Yeah, let's hold back because I I want to talk uh, continue the conversation about the new senior producer. To to end the Sasha thing though, I am glad that she's not a producer because that means she's gonna be on camera more and still so. That's great. Let me clear up what I said last week. I said that I had a theory and I was going to tell you off air because I wasn't sure I wasn't sure if I could say it yet. That is because I got a hint from Christian as to what might be happening tonight. And I was trying not to spoil it on Smoville podcast. So my theory was based on me asking Christian This is after we found out Mary was going to leave. I texted him and said, wouldn't it be funny if you, for like one episode, made Finstock the producer, sort of like how Matt Damon took control of the Jimmy Kimmel show, that one episode, and you just made it a, uh, purposely made it a shit show and put Finstock in charge and it would be the greatest thing ever and it would be hilarious. And he said that it's already in the works. So I was like, okay, great. And I didn't know the capacity. I didn't know if it was going to be this episode in particular. They could have done something else with it. I wasn't positive. But I didn't want to say it on Schmoville Podcast and ruin the surprise if we did start this episode. And it just be a shit show from Finstock. So they kind of did it by doing, you know, how they announced Amiri's exit. Which was the, the three fake outs or whatever it is. And Finstock, for one... I was actually really looking forward to see what Finstock was going to (laughs) do. Like, I was really excited for that. And I don't know if everybody was, but I was really, really excited. Uh, But they had the Finstock fake out. He was funny as hell. But at that moment, what were you thinking when Finstock came out and they started doing that? Well, what I was thinking in the moment, because I knew what your prediction was, I'm like, how Snelling is jumping up and down right now. He is... Uh, he cannot wait to brag about this on the Schmoville podcast. And I, I didn't really buy it, but I knew in that moment that you were going crazy. And obviously, Miri was never going to sign off on Finstock as being her replacement. <laughs> Not that she had any say in it, but she did endorse someone. And, you know, Riley basically told me in his interview that Cobster was going to be taking over. There was a bit of misdirection on Christian's part again. He loves the misdirection by saying that Cobster was too young. But uh, yeah, I, was, uh, I wasn't falling for Finstock based on the teasing that Christian did recently uh, a couple episodes ago. Well, how you felt about Finstock, I felt that way about Ken Knapsack. I was so hoping that Ken was somehow able to come back. And I knew his Screen Junkies contract is exclusive. I knew it was never going to happen. Well, exclusive to a point. I think part of the original deal did allow him to come back to Schmoes and do stuff like the news and be on the show. After all, Christian is the one who called Andy and suggested JT and Ken uh, to, to work for them. So they must have worked out something to where Christian could still use his guys when needed. But when he came out... Part of me just had this this wishful thinking in mind. You know, what if the, the pit boss did come back? Maybe it's possible, but obviously I didn't buy into it too much. What about you? So we had the, the we both had opposite thoughts. How I felt for Thin, Finstock, you felt for Knapsack, and vice versa. Right. Um, which is very funny. Yeah. The second I don't know if it was just because I'd just gotten faked out by Finstock when Ken came out. I was like, well, that's for some reason less likely because <laughs> Knapsack has other things to do and Finstock has nothing else to do. Um, yeah, I, I I knew that it was another fake out and which is unfortunate because I I would have liked to have seen Knapsack come back, I guess. I just knew that it wasn't going to happen, but as someone who didn't experience, uh, Ken's phases live, it would have been, it would have been a nice change up and a nice callback for everyone else. So I'm sure plenty of people were thinking the same thing you were. Uh, without question. Let me be clear. I didn't fall for it. I was just being wishful. wishful. Yeah, I was sure. I was hoping that it would come true, even though I knew it wasn't. Gotcha. I knew it was all BS. Gotcha. Um, so, again, another fake out. And then they announced Copster, which my reaction to that was, why didn't we guess that? Like, now, once they revealed Copster, it was like, well, duh. That's the educated guess, even with the misdirect by Christian. 
Like, why on earth wouldn't it have been Copster? It, it, I felt really, really stupid. I don't know how you felt about it. But. Again, I had an idea because of Riley, and I just, I don't know, based on when Miri kind of endorsed someone last week or the week before, it just seemed like Copster from the start. And let me just say, I, I've been clear about this before, but you know, Christian Chupacabra was not my first choice to take over. But I am coming around to the idea because of something I've been talking about a lot lately. When you bring in experienced and talented people into the mix, people that have been in this industry for a while, they're going to be recruited by bigger entities at some point. It's just the nature of this space. Catherine, Katie, Tiffany, Miri, Alicia, Ken, JTE all moved up in some way, shape, or form. And the same goes for plenty of other people who've passed through AMC and Collider. So bringing another experienced talent on as producer would just lead to the same situation all over again where they eventually leave. And since Cobster is only 22 years of age, like you, Snelling, (laughs) in essence, Schmoes is his THR. It is his hit fix. It is his screen junkies. And they've wisely made him full time to where he just might be the first person to ever work full-time for Schmoes and actually get paid for it without having to work another day job or tour the country doing stand-up or raise a family in the process. So this is what I've wanted for a while. Someone who is able to make the Schmoes the priority, the priority, not a priority. So I'm rooting for Cobster. I'm sure he understands the opportunity and the advantage that he has that other producers of this show did not have. So Cobster, best of luck and make us proud. That is 100% the best thing about it. The fact that he is full time and going back to what I said about the 30 for 30 doc. If this is what's going to happen while Copster is working there, then Collider is all the better for it. And I am so rooting for this. And I think it's exactly what they needed. Definitely smart move on Mary's Mary's point or Christian or Mark, who everyone who was involved in this decision, kudos to you. I am so excited to see everything that Copster does. I have to ask you this because you can better inform me than anyone. Copster mentioned he wanted to go back to a phase three vibe, which is from the frog jump days. Is that <laughs> able to, can that happen in the Collider studio? How do you think that's going to work? I have several reasons why that is not possible. And I think Christian Chupacabra should focus on capturing a unique vibe that the Collider Studio can bring. It's certainly not going to bring Phase 3's vibe. So let me explain these reasons. Number one, the studio situation simply doesn't allow for it. The way the sets are adjacent to each other creates a disconnect. Unlike Phase 3 and Phase 5, where you put everybody in a small room with alcohol, it sets off a reaction like the carbonated beverage Harloff date night analogy I made earlier in the show. Number two, you've got corporate backing. Whether they choose to admit it or not, they do have to check themselves in ways they didn't have to during phase three and phase five since they represent Collider, Complex, etc. The days of having porn stars on the show are long gone, as well as being completely blotto on air. Number three, the gang is four to five years older, and so with age, you're going to mellow out a bit. Christian was relentless on the mic if you watch those Phase 3 episodes. The show moved to evenings at Toad Hop to their Hollywood location. The show took on a life of its own in terms of energy. He'd drink a lot more, like I said earlier, and he would sustain that energy throughout an entire episode. So at the beginning of tonight's episode, or, or the most recent episode, 253, His giggly energy reminded me so much of Phase 3 when he'd laugh so much throughout the entire episode. Number four, the show was new to everybody in Phase 3, and they were jacked for it because they all got to hang out in this tight little room. 
Plus, they weren't on camera the rest of the week doing other shows like they are now. Guys like Riley, guys like Makuga would appear as often as possible, even if it meant standing in the background. Now, they space out their appearances because they both work full-time jobs outside of the show. The same goes for Ken, JTE, as well as Tiffany. When they would appear on Schmoes No, they're doing the show nowadays after a long day, a long week of work. Back in phase three, their entire weeks were built around this one show. So that's why the SPR experience is so important to this show, because she's always bringing the heat. She's always bringing that energy whenever the guys might be exhausted from talking about Deadshot all day. And my last reason why you can't capture Phase Three's vibe again is phone calls. So much energy would come in response to fans calling in and providing a spark that they'd run with for a while. So it's not impossible to capture some of this at Collider, but it, it simply has a different vibe. And that's the first impression that I had when Phase 6 began. It felt more like a show than a party like After Buzz and Toad Hop. Very good points. I don't have anything else to expand Ranted. on, really. That's okay. You did a good job. Um, time will tell when this stuff. Again, I, I still wish him the best of luck. Um, I think nothing but good comes out of this, for sure. Oh, good stuff will come. I just wouldn't focus on Phase 3 as the, the goal to recapture. Qu- let me give a quick Howard Stern analogy, because I know Christian loves those. If you look at Howard Stern in the early 2000s, as well as the 90s, he's got a very different delivery than he does now. He's quicker. He's more aggressive. Uh, he's He was very sharp, very... Uh, abrasive and brutal. And that kind of reminds me of Christian during phase three. Nowadays, Howard Stern has mellowed out a bit. Uh, He's got a new wife. He is very, uh, I guess he's grown up a lot in a lot of ways. And Christian, when I look at him now, he's also grown up in a lot of ways. And part of that's the alcohol. Part of that's not having phone calls, but he presents himself in a in a more calm, collected manner than he was then. He was never unprofessional, don't get me wrong, but the vibe that he carries out is different nowadays than right. then. You're in Schmoville. Who do we got? Right. Okay. Right. One final history lesson real quick before we go. This is just kind of random. It doesn't really pertain to anything that we saw this week, except it was in one of the images of the 30 for 30. What the hell is the origin of Scott Mance and Cocaine Donkey? Scott Mance, obviously very high energy guy. He wore that shirt to celebrate their 200 show mark, their achievement, 200 shows. And I'm not sure where the Uh nickname originated, but based on the fact that Mance has so much energy, someone must have coined the phrase or the nickname Cocaine Donkey. And he represented that nickname with that t-shirt on the celebration for 200 episodes. So... That's all I got off the cuff. Okay. Well, do you have any idea why Scott Mance would ask people to stop referring to that and to stop calling him that? I didn't know that. Yeah. I did not know that he did not want to be called that anymore. When did you find this out? So this was posted in, I guess, the Smobile Facebook group, which I guess is why you didn't know about it. But this was actually very early on in Phase 6. It might have even happened before Phase 6. And I didn't know anything about it. I was brand new to the group. I was gearing up for the very my very first episode of the live show. But Christian posted on the Facebook group saying that, basically, and I'm paraphrasing, but he was dead serious. He said that out of respect for Scott Mance, we all have to stop referring to him as Cocaine Donkey or saying Cocaine Donkey. And it was very serious. And I didn't really understand what it meant to begin with because the only time I had ever heard of it was when Roka was on movie talk and I think he said cocaine donkey in one of his rants as the outlaw challenging him uh for the very first maybe that's what it was phase six had already been going on for a while and it was the start of the schmodown maybe that's what I'm thinking of but anyway Roka called him cocaine donkey at the end of movie talk no way I'm remembering that wrong I think I'm sorry. I'm all over the place. Christian posted that on the Facebook group at the beginning of phase six. But Roka still called him that during an outlaw rant on movie talk. 
so I'm misremembering that. But in it, anyway, to sum it up, the whole point is that nobody's been calling him that anymore due to Christian and Scott's wishes, and I didn't know if you had any idea where that had come from. Well, the, the nickname I understand based on Mance's personality, and I, obviously the shirt was from the 200 episode, and Mance has a career that is pretty great. I mean, he's worked for Axis Hollywood plus a number of other places, so maybe it caused some friction with his other employers. They don't want their employee to be known as the cocaine donkey. Maybe it was a conversation (laughs) he was forced to have with Christian and he respected his wishes. I also think to that point that Sasha's famous nickname, I won't say it, but it refers to her mouth. At some point, I think she asked the Schmoes to not refer to her by that nickname because I haven't heard that nickname on the show in quite a while either. You're right. I haven't heard either. I don't know. I just thought that was interesting. Um, The final thing was the superhero news, but Christian kind of addressed it during the live show. That was the other exciting thing that sort of happened this week. I don't know if you want to touch on it. I don't really have anything to say because, again, I think Christian just kind of put the lid on it. But Yeah, I mean, I, I was talking to you via DM before all that drama went down, and I was kind of expressing my concern over the fact that they were suddenly getting back into scoops. I thought there was too much risk and too little reward by doing this. And they're they're not known for doing this. Yes, they've done it in the past, but that doesn't mean they're known for doing this. And obviously it backfired. Everything's fine now, but I did express some some hesitance when I heard that they were going to do this. And even if this person's been reliable in the past, there's too many things that can go wrong. And that's why Campia has always said he doesn't even bother with scoops anymore just because too much can go wrong. And unfortunately, some people got dragged into this like the schmoesno.com writers. And that's not fair at all. They're just reporting uh, what has been told to them. And I, I hate to see Schmoesno getting dragged into this. Um, I just feel I feel bad for everybody involved. I really do. And James Gunn has been on AMC Movie Talk before. I mean, Christian and Mark were part-timers then, but obviously James Gunn didn't know exactly whom he was speaking to. And it's just, it's just an uncomfortable situation for everybody. And I just wish that they just passed on these scoops, so to speak, and, and just kind of stay to what they're doing. Because what they're doing right now is going to take off even more, especially with Jeremy Johns joining the family. Right. Well said. And again, I'm glad that Riley defended the writers because, again, and I sort of voiced my opinion on it when we were talking about that Umberto drama with Makuga. It's like part of me just thinks it's just way too serious. And I know it's some people's lives, but to get mad at people for writing something that happens to not be true, it's like, okay, you know, they have their source. Their source either made it up or it was an old rumor. It's like, it's just. It's not that serious. And the fact that the guy on Superhero News uh, kind of got upset with Christian a little bit. And anyway, that's all over with. Who is he to get upset, though? Who is he? Come on. I don't know. I didn't know who it was because he was tweeting from Batman News' Twitter account. This is a rhetorical question, but I mean, who is he to actually get upset at another vendor that is bigger than his for reporting something like that? that? That was uncalled for, too. But. Do you think Josh McCuga referred to Schmoesno.com as liars? Do you think he thinks they are liars <laughs> for getting a scoop wrong? That's a great way to end the show. <laughs> well done. <laughs> okay. When asked for comment, Josh McCuga replied, Schmoesno, they are liars. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for listening to this episode of the Schmoville Podcast. We love doing this thing. If you are listening to us on the YouTube channel, just know that we're on the Schmoes No Podcast feed as well, wherever podcasts are found. And if you're listening there, just know we're on the YouTube channel. Uh, I love the YouTube channel personally just because we get to hear from you guys. So just comment down below like you always do. We love engaging with you guys. We love our conversation continuing in those comments section. We're glad that you guys... Uh, enjoy it as much as we do and make sure that you tell christian and mark how much you love our show brian davids my man where can the people find you online you guys can follow me brian davids on twitter at bdf331 check out my podcast film schlubs wherever podcasts are found all old episodes can be found at film schlubs coming up we've got a fall tv preview 
and I've got some great interviews for you guys as well. So that is that. Awesome. You can find me on Twitter at WhatUpSnell and Instagram Ryan Snelling. I don't currently have a podcast, but something is very much in the works, and I am very excited to reveal that. I will reveal it probably on Twitter, so again, follow me there, and you'll know the next thing that I'm doing. But, you know, as always, I'm Ryan Snelling. And I'm Brian Davids. Thanks for listening, guys. We'll see you next week.